History and Potential, Isabel Lewis, in conversation with Brooke Holmes. Um, I'm grateful to Princeton University's Lewis Center for the Arts, who have co-sponsored this event, and to NYU's Remark Institute, who are co-presenting with us today. Just a quick word about CBA. Um, we're an international institute for the performing arts organized around dance, with a special interest in the contemporary use of classical forms. We have a fellowship program and a series of public events, and this year we've asked fellows to design and host one of our public events. This is our first, and it is hosted by this year's fellow and uh, CBA affiliate, Brooke Holmes. So I'm just going to do a few brief introductions before I turn it over to Isabel and Brooke. Brooke is the Susan Dodd Brown, Professor of Classics at Princeton University, and her work explores concepts of the body, nature, and matter, from Greek and Roman textual sources to contemporary theory, visual arts, and performance. Brooke's full bio, along with Isabel's, and pretty much anything else you'd want to know is in the chat. Um, but just let me highlight that she's also the recipient of fellowships from the Mellon Foundation, Guggenheim, and the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library. She collaborates with artists and curators for exhibitions and panels at domestic and international institutions. And um, in addition to all of this, she is a wonderful writer, and I can recommend to you her books, such as The Symptom and the Subject, The Emergence of the Physical Body in Ancient Greek, and Gender, Antiquity, and Its Legacy as well as her work in journals such as EFLA, Bomb, Public Culture, Political Concepts, and Cabinet, among many others. Brooke is joined today by her longtime collaborator, the artist and choreographer, Isabel Lewis, and we're very, very happy to welcome her to today's event. Isabel was born in 1981 in the Dominican Republic, and she is now based in Berlin in Germany. Trained in dance, literary criticism, and philosophy, she began her professional career in contemporary dance in 2003, but the formal arrangement of the proscenium and the relationship to the audience that it dictated, she found a bit constraining, and so she began showing her work instead in bars, living rooms, and gardens, all places where she could interact directly with the public. She also now works in galleries and is interested in rethinking institutional protocols around ideas of exhibition and performance. So you can see she's very, very wide ranging. To give you just one example of her, of her work, which is quite uh, far reaching and vast, at the Gropius Bow in 2019, Isabel presented Garden of Earthly Delights, Expanded Viewing 1 and 2. In this work, she was interested in the dramaturgical structure of Bosch's triptych, and she made a large-scale choreographic work that took visitors through a series of gallery spaces, one of which included Bosch's painting. And there was choreography, musical performance, and smells, which made the museum into a kind of sensorium. Isabel's works have been presented at venues internationally, including, among many others, the Kate Muse Modern, Kunsthal Zurich, Palais de Tokyo, and the Dia Foundation in New York. She is currently leading the class for performative arts at the Fine Academy in Leipzig. And again, you can find much more information about her in the chat. Um, finally, I need to offer a few logistical notes. We will take questions from the audience at the end, so please click the Q&A button to ask your questions, and we will collect them and try to get to as many as we can. If you need tech help, please privately message the host of the, of the webinar, Christian Duraso, in the chat, and she will do her best to help you. This webinar will officially end at 1230, and we know that many of you will have to leave at this point, but if you are available to stay or would like to, we will probably run over a few minutes to continue the conversation. So 
I am now happy to turn things over to Brooke Holmes, who will frame the event and then bring Isabel in for an extended conversation about her work. Brooke. Thank you so much, Jennifer. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's an enormous pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to be in conversation today with Isabel Lewis under the auspices of the wonderful Center for Ballet and the Arts. And I want to start by thanking CBA um, for hosting us, and especially Jennifer Homans, Christian Darso, and Andrea Salvatore. Uh, and I'm especially grateful to Isabel for taking the time today to speak to, to us about her practice and her recent work. So Isabel and I met um, about six years ago now in summer 2016. We were put in touch by our mutual friend, the artist Asad Raza, who brought us together for a collaboration on a, on a workshop at the Fondation Bogosian in Brussels. Isabel was in New York at that time to realize um, a commission from DIA, occasions and other occurrences. Um, and so that meant that I had the opportunity not only to meet Isabel informally, I also had the opportunity on that occasion to um, experience an occasion. The occasion is an experimental form that Isabel began to develop about a decade ago. It marks her shift away from putting a performer on stage for an audience for crafting embodied forms of being together where the line between uh, performer and audience begins to break down. So it was in the space of the occasion and that evening that Isabel and I began an ongoing conversation about the body and the soul, about the ancient Greco-Roman past and the lived present, and about entangled relationality as an object of aesthetic attention and conceptual attention. Isabel's work, I would say, dilates the very sense of the aesthetic. Aesthetics comes from the ancient Greek word for perception or sensation perception, eisthesis. And within the history of the body that unfolds over two millennia, two and a half millennia from ancient Greek philosophy and medicine, the sensing body sits between a kind of unsettling openness to the world, a porosity to the world, and the human capacity to know that world and often to try to master that world. Vision above all in this tradition is prized. Seeing is the path to knowledge that will make you like a god, needing no one and nothing. The formation of modern aesthetics in the 18th century is itself shaped by the encounter with the classical body of Greco-Roman sculpture and its ideal beauty, gendered male, read through the lens of modern anti-blackness as white and normatively able. And seeing in this tradition remains the privileged sense. So when I speak about Isabel's work as a dilation of the aesthetic, I mean in part the way that it creatively engages the attention of the entire sensorium through new aesthetic uh, technologies that are addressed in particular to smell, to sound, and to touch. And so here's what Isabel says in an interview that we did for I invite visitors to stretch their senses to the limits of the sensible and approach the extrasensory in order to become receptive to the multiple forms of presence we live and die alongside. These multiple forms of presence encompass a capacious sense of space and time in Isabel's work. In the interview, she goes on to say, quote, while presence can be thought of as happening in the present, I think the experience of presence is more like a collapse of the temporal logic of past, present, and future, end quote. So time is unfolded in the space of Isabel's work as the surfacing of various archives, individual and collective. In existing otherwise, these were the histories of the Wetherill Mansion in Philadelphia space of Plato's Symposium with Isabel as host. The speaker of the host speaks to the other dimension of the dilation of the aesthetic that I wanted to talk about just at the very beginning. And this is the endless reinvention of sociality and collectivity as the conditions of aesthetic experience in Isabel's work. Isabel's choreography is always socio choreographed engaged with the communities embedded in genres of social dance, such as Kizomba, a genre which originated in the late 70s in Angola. And Isabel's work is always engaged in the communities that are created through the work itself, in its performance and enactment in real time. These communities extend into the non-human. Plants have long been a central part of Isabel's practice, and we'll have the opportunity to her today hear about her work with whole giant symbiotic communities of diverse life forms. And collaboration with other artists and thinkers stands at the heart of Isabel's practice. The figure of conversation I found is integral to it. So it is a singular honor to be able to continue our conversation here today. 
And without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Isabel, um, who will talk a bit uh, about her recent work and several works in particular. And then the two of us um, will engage in conversation. We'll have a, a brief listen exercise about two and a half minutes before we transition to the Q&A. So without further ado, uh, Isabel, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, Brooke, and uh, thank you all for the invitation and for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to get to continue this conversation that uh, Brooke and I have been having for quite some time. And uh, this ever ongoing, continuous, ever wondrous space of the so called body, what we refer to as the body. Uh, what we, how we've come to understand that in a, in a contemporary logic and been an incredible site of diverse experimentation uh, since as long as uh, human history is, is around. Yes, I appreciate getting to continue this conversation and, and have that focus as I speak through a few uh, works of mine. So I was hoping to start with introducing um, the hosted occasions so this practice of mine that evolves out of a long process of working as a performer, working as a choreographer, um, an experience and embodied and long-lived experience of creating works for the concert stage. Um, inside of uh, that practice of being engaged with the theater and the, the kind of machine of perception, the particular kind of machine of perception that the theater is, I think my, my early stage works were all quite concerned with addressing my anxiousness around that mode of listening the subject on stage and uh, this, this um, objectified distant body that uh, could be sort of judged in a work that could be judged that it has a discrete object of aesthetic observation. And it took quite a long time, uh, in almost 10 years of creating choreographic works within the theater and trying to operate upon the architectures of the theater itself and the conditions of the theater itself, the placements between the floor and then the placements of the actual um, lighting rooms and the kind of hardware of the theater. Before I started to understand that perhaps it's, it's a change of the sociality that I'm looking for, it's a transformation of the social ritual of the theater that is perhaps something I'm seeking. And this is where, in my thinking, the major shift happens um, with thinking about the host and the guest as opposed to the ever more contentious sort of audience versus performer, audience and performer divide. And I'm trying to really reconceptualize that for myself in order to find a new ability, but new ways to tell the stories I want to tell. Because for me, I require leaving the space of representation and entering into action and into real dialogue and addressing the public directly in my work. So perhaps we can have a look at the first slides to we'll show some different iterations of the occasion. Um, so the hosted occasion is the, the name that I gave to a practice of gathering human and non-human agents uh, in a kind of celebratory gathering that would direct all of the senses. And so I was definitely very clearly informed and inspired by different forms of uh, ritualized forms of gathering, such as the symposium itself, the drinking party, uh, the French salons of um, the 19th century, um, and other forms of gathering that included uh, sociality, as well as exchange of knowledge, as well as kind of sensuous embodied experience in the form of perhaps entertainment and food and Music. Um, so the, the naming and coming and sort of arriving to the idea of the occasion was a way for me to frame and stake out space uh, for the kind of form of the work I was wanting to do um, that would move against the motion of the event, the event that sort of rises up out of nowhere as a, as a space for uh, focused concentration and, and, and an interest in actually allowing the space of performance to create a diverse range of, of means of engagement and kinds of engagement, a space that we have 
maybe suggest ways of being and interacting in the space, but who are ultimately um, guests themselves and can actually navigate through and become a co creative part of the performance um, in terms of how they live and direct their own attention to the space. So we think this is an ideal foundation for the 16th work, and also this sort of one feature here in Shanghai. We can look at this. This is uh, yet another iteration in Shanghai at um, the main contemporary art museum. And what you'll see across a few different images is a kind of a vernacular that appears that has to do with um, local, like finding local solutions to the installations. So, so that it's a rather protocol and a choreography that is unfolded rather than um, a particular set of materials that would travel from place to place or museum to museum. And it's rather a, a, a long and a participatory journey with each institution to actually um, create these kind of spaces where um, the ranging of elements of plant life um, furniture elements that engage the visitors' uh, quality, sensation, and different ways of being and holding their bodies and like, choreographically moving through the space, um, including yeah, materials, found materials, recycled materials, borrowed materials, rented materials, always trying to generate the least possible and, and to generate a kind of yeah, community, I would say, of, of agents. Uh, in varying degrees of agency, but that we become aware of one another inside of the space of sociality. Slide here, this is in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So the classic occasion evolved to start to include um, local performers wherever the work was touring. So when this was to be, I felt too large for my presence to effectively. Um, transmit itself uh, through the space. Um, it became interesting for me as well to share the practice of hosting with local performers um, and engage with them in kind of intensive workshop in order to then um, continue to make these choreographies and to unfold the themes and conversations of the work, which are ultimately around questions of human flourishing. How as how as humans now do we flourish, and what inhibits that potential to flourish. We can go ahead to the next. So this is a recent one. ways, practices, practices that might actually get us in touch with this the sensation of this fine um, this fine kind of anatomy of, of the of spirit and soul in, in relation to body and those relationships. Um, so we can just to get a sense of the space. Here we're seeing the spaces are this is in the tanks, a large seven hundred square meter space. Um, which my intervention into that space was to create a kind of hanging garden, which you see behind the dancer here. Um, that is a kind of expression for me of the, the intangibleness of uh, life and technology. And this created the kind of what I would call the, the decor of the occasions. For me, I don't shy away from the idea of decor. Uh, applied arts, the sense of um, creating an ambiance of welcome, of hospitality, a place where people want to bring their home in my work, and uh, it's durational, it's a durational situation where my hope is to engage the performer, to linger, to stay, uh, the longer you stay, the more of the work unfolds to you. Um, there is as well repetition and and leaps, but also the situation evolves according to the engagement of the visitors. So the space should be inviting, and uh, this was part of that affective, affective treatment of the space. It was damp, the air was damp and humid, um, the moss uh, generates its own um, kind of greenish smell. 
um, is really for me all ways of really enhancing the multiple purposes of the visitor to create a kind of maximum effect with sort of minimum um, waste. Sure. These green gardens that I created um, with the help of our architect Juan Chacon. He figured out uh, the way to engineer these columns, which were themselves a choreographic element. Uh, these steel cables that had different ways of crossing to create actually different shapes and forms in the space, and they were all, um, it's really tension that, that holds, that helps them to hold one form. So I really also saw that as a, an expression as well of the choreography or my way of relating materially to uh, the choreography of Zomba. In fact, and soon we'll see a slide that we'll see some of the dancing. This is the dance of Kizomba. Um, in this moment of a five hour long occasion, uh, there's a moment where uh, I have, I have invited dancers from the scene in London, so having worked in London in preparation for this show, I also engaged with the communities that dance Kizomba socially and invited them into space as collaborators of this work. Um, and the public is as well invited to, in this moment of the show, to partake in the practice and get a, a feeling for what it feels like to put the chest to another chest and to um, and actually experience this this uh, proximity and this closeness and what happens when through um, the negotiation of weight and the coordination of um, sort of breath and movement, a sense of communion is formed between oneself and the other. Here we are. Yeah, this is also the, the, just the beginning of that, that situation where the public is uh, just about to learn the very first basics of Zomba in order to feel this heart to heart of connection that I can give up in the show. Here we are shifting into the recent works. This is this work that we're looking at is called Scalable Skeletal Escalator. And I just want to check in and make sure, are we okay on time? Is there anything, Brooke, that you'd like to add or, or ask at this point? Otherwise, I will continue. I think, why don't you continue um, for another five minutes or so, and then I can ask questions and we can talk about those works. So as the, the occasions, um, for me, continuous and constant experimentation with format of live presentation is pretty um, urgent for me. It's, it's for me, has so, so much to do with how we perceive the other, how we come into contact, which kind of potential for communion, temporary communities um, are there. So my input, these, these interests really take me from really club practices like DJing, hosting parties to exhibitions to theater to performances. So this kind of experimentation continues in relation to the, the relation, how the relational um, is uh, created and like staged, but also actually created. So in Scalable Skeletal Escalator, um, we have a different, rather than a, a, a common gathering space, as you've seen in other occasion works, um, this is a work that actually unfolds on three level architecture of the Blue Blood building um, in Zurich, where Prince Tully Zurich resides on two floors. But I also wanted to address the entire architecture and also opened up the basement as a part of the dramaturgy of the exhibition. So visitors would arrive to the second floor, come up to the third floor, and then be able to take the stairs and elevate down to the basement that hosted what I call the compost of the exhibition. So the, the compost, this exhibition one um, it was about six weeks long and inside of that the the exhibition on two floors was sort of uh, remade every day in response to the visitors so there's a kind of protocol and a game structure position that the dancers and performers um, play with themselves and with the audience and with the uh, elements of the install so everything was 
movable, changeable, spinnable, rotatable. Um, and uh, on the basement level was, a, was an actual kind of hub of continuous work and creation. Uh, things would kind of drift down from the other floors of exhibition, enter into the compost and be and start to become digested and sometimes reappear in other parts of the exhibition as the exhibition went on. Um, I will, I do want to name, because important to this work, is this, the hollow biot. So, so Brooke has uh, mentioned uh, my work with this figure of the hollow biot as an, a multi-organismic uh, creature that um, kind of comes together to create uh, another creature that is um, more than the sum of its parts. And uh, this was a kind of a hollow biot as a, as a figure of thinking was for me incredibly inspiring, also in terms of thinking about um, the way that we think about the body itself. And um, I wanted to apply this while by this time, 2020, um, I had already been thinking about and working with the figure of the hollow biot through um, becoming very inspired with and kind of doing a duet with, I would say, lichen. So lichen as a as a, a form of life that um, is indeed a hollow biont, um, and that uh, well, okay, that will be a, a longer that would be a longer tangent. I'll bring it back to this exhibition to say that uh, what I wanted to do with the figure of the hollow biont is actually implement it as a methodology for exhibition making, and in doing so, in, invited. A, transformed the solo exhibition format of an invitation from a Kunsthalle um, into a, an exhibition um, where I invited several different collaborators. Um, and I just would like to name them, um, take this moment to name them, because this work you're seeing um, is made possible through these collaborative efforts um, by artists operating in a multitude of fields. So Dirk Bell and Mo Stern, who created this custom-made speaker system that you see in the center of this photo. Um, you have the uh, dancers, Lara de Masso, uh, The Field, which is a, a collective um, based out of Tanzhaus Zurich, Rafael Piaginski, uh, Matthias Ringenberg, and Juliette Uzor are the dancers inhabiting spaces. And um, the music that we wove through all three levels was created by labor. Um, which is Colin Hecklander and Faranaz Fatan. And the paintings um, that you see here uh, are by Matthew Butts Kamoy. Uh, there were also smells on the various levels of the, that, that you would be addressed to smell on the various levels of the museum. Um, these were produced by artist and researcher Cecil Tolas. And the garments that we were wearing were also made in collaboration with Marcelo Al-Qaeda and Yolanda Zobo. Um, so many of them actually are long-term collaborators of mine and including, in, this was a co-production between Kunsthalle Zurich, Tanzhaus Zurich, and as well Kali's Berlin, uh, my studio in Berlin, where my studio was housed in Berlin. I think it's always important for me to, to really name the people that enlivened and, and, and really um, my role was as initiator and as the weaver of uh, this work, bringing it into a choreographic dramaturgical um, ordering that could refresh itself and renew itself every day um, in response to the visitors. We can just put through these, I think, into it. And I, what I can say is that also the, the themes of this work uh, have very much to do with the history of the body itself and sort of mining that history and, and diving in and reimagining um, different approaches and different practices that would allow us to, to fantasize and reimagine our bodies and actually perform that and, and with the witness of the visitors. This is the compost the exhibition. So um, much of the, the, all of this plastic were, were things that Dirk Bell and I were collecting and, and uh, you know, from trash sites and recovering. And we were very fascinated with the idea of trying to decompose them um, with the collaboration of the wax moth. So in this space, we're actually working at uh, decomposing these 
um, materials with the wax moth whose figure appears again in the upper floors and the paintings um, as a kind of um, inspiring figure of the idea of transformation, also the idea of contamination. Like how do we deal with this contaminated body on this contaminated planet that we have and what aesthetic potentials or resources are there in in looking at that um, contamination and the will to try to non to try to kind of work on beauty <laughs> to what can be pulled out of that um, as as reflection or as um, perhaps cultivating a capacity for transformation or change. And here it is in the last photos as a it was transformed as well as it was a co-production between Tanzhaus Zurich and Kunsthalle Zurich. It was. Um, its second phase was as a theater work. So I call that scalable skeletal escalator theater mode. And it's an hour and a half, uh, or it's an hour long uh, concert dance work, let's say. Thank you so much, Isabel. I wanna um, pull us into conversation gently i think um but i have so many so many questions but i think uh the one that i wanted to start with um was you had mentioned on the kizomba occasion and, and thinking about aristotle uh, and the history of kind of body and soul and i couldn't help but start thinking about aristotle is so important for imagining kind of imminence between body and soul that he has this this line in, in his text on the soul you know they're not just fellow travelers, they're sort of, you know, made for one another. But at the same time, he's so anxious about affects or sensation getting into the soul and disturbing its its autonomy. And so you get this kind of push and pull around like autonomy and entanglement. And I wanted to ask you, thinking about sensing as so crucial to your work in terms of that openness and inviting openness, particularly through smell, sound, um, and senses we don't usually engage, but in a way that, you know, might not feel like, so to speak, an assault, like the ways in which you use ambiance to create entanglements between people that might be emergent um, in, in the space and time of the exhibition. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about your commitment to the, the full sensorium in, in your engagement with the body. Yes, I think, um, yeah, thanks for that question. And I think early on it has to do with my my relation to the the kind of visual the, the technology of visualization that the theater is and that the exhibition is and that um digitally mediated forms as we're working on as we're working with now um this dominance of the visual inside of the, the, the western canon of, of education how we've been educated to use the eyes i think i have a a, a deep um, mistrust about it and I think uh, inside of that comes a wish to try to unify a human sensorium, a, a wish to kind of um, take the, the, the power that we give uh, nowadays to the visual and to bring it into check by somehow maybe trying to amplify or rehabilitate the other senses. Because my, my feeling was that we actually need new um not even necessarily new. We, the qualitative has been there, like qualitative understandings. You know, it's the quantitative understandings of things that's very recent. Um, but I felt that how do we address this qualitative knowledge today um, and which tools and techniques and practices can we engage with that would allow us to have a higher, to, to, to cultivate a higher sensitivity for this qualitative understandings. And this is, I think, where this, this impetus or this need to try to start imagining artistic formats that really address the entire human sensorium and kind of bring the, the, um, the guest into a, a kind of a maximum amount of sort of affectivity while at the same time making sure that they have the agency, uh, that they're granted the agency to be able to navigate that space, to be able to exit and ex enter, enter and exit at their will, and that there's always a, a host as well, that then the hosting, the figure of the host, I think is important for also giving and providing orientation for the guest in order for them to be able to navigate those spaces uh, with their agency sort of activated and then to manage the degree of engagement they want to have. 
that's, I want to come back to this question, I think, of, of the kinds of feedback loops, but I wonder if I could go back to um, what you were saying about, you know, these techniques, as it were, are new, but they're also old. And I think your work is so fascinating in the capaciousness of the archive that it's activating and drawing on. And so something that's been really amazing for me being at CBA is in thinking about the history of dance is thinking about the body as an archive, um, a choreographic archive, you know, in multiple ways. Um, and you're certainly working with the body as an archive in, in the sense of dance, but you're also thinking about the history of the body. You read widely in um, the history of the body, thinking about the pre-modern in particular um and also you know i'm thinking about the holobiont comes out of i think lynn margulis's work and so working with um science scientists as other sort of um agents of knowing to to use a term that i know that, that you use and so i wanted to ask a little bit about how your own um thinking about the archive in your work with the sensory and with the body um has sort of unfolded across your your work and how you're thinking about it now Thanks. I think this this initial encounter with classical ballet, I think, made a massive impact on me in many ways, intellectually, spiritually, physically. I think uh, in many ways, I think my, my history of dance starts much earlier than that as a Dominican child, as a Dominican born person. Um, I pretty much learned to dance uh, Bachata, merengue, salsa, pretty much as soon as I could walk. So these languages were in my body. And uh, at, at, at a certain age, the age of 11, I, I take on the, it's my will and my desire that my parents support to study in a very serious way uh, classical ballet uh, for many years. And, and that, that journey, uh, in my intellectual journey, uh, was also growing as I was kind of growing into teenagehood. Um, brought me towards searching for contemporary forms of dance, um, improvisation, contemporary dance, modern dance. Um, I started to, as I started to choreograph and create my own work, um, I started to encounter how, how um, written upon I felt my body was by ballet, actually, that, that in, try, in this process of actually wanting to develop my own choreographic language, I, I found my body and the habits of um, classical ballet very much. And while this was, um, this was at that point in my life a bit disturbing to me, I thought, can I, can I erase this code that I've inscribed onto me? And, and sort of having a, a bit of a, let's say, a, critique on, uh, yeah, like, what, what is this language of, of the colonial language that I've now inscribed onto this brown body? Um, I moved through that. That was one phase. And what I, what I understood or what became more interesting to me was, or, or more possible as well, I said, okay, I cannot erase. Uh, I, I can only uh, complexify and I can only layer and add ever more layers. And actually, maybe it's not something I want to erase. It's something that I chose. I was attracted to classical ballet, it's discipline, it's particular, and it's as long as I don't need to look at it as some kind of um, unreachable standard of something, you know, if I, if I appreciate it for its historical context and contextualize it for kind of what it is, I can become interested in it next to uh, many other languages of the body and many other codes of the body. And I think this begins a much deeper look for me into even sociological concepts of habitus, you know, really trying to peel back the layers of the archive that my body has had become and, and, and is becoming. Um, and, uh, you know, in postmodern dance, you kind of have this idea of the, this kind of neutral um, I, I notion of the body that as though you can actually find some sort of neutral state upon which to then compose. Um, which I also ultimately rejected as uh, that that that's impossible. Like each, it's it, there is no neutral. It's all um, composed, or it's culturally it's a it's a culturally composed uh, choreography that we perform depending on where and how and under which conditions we've been raised um, and grown up and then come into being. So that complex mix became something that rather than feeling um, frustrated by, I started to be very inspired by actually the fact that um, this writtenness, this codedness of the body, and to what degree can I become conscious of the code, to what degree can I stylize and change that code, how can I use that code, different multiple codes as forms of communication and exchange.
Wow. I mean, that the way you were just describing it, I think your lived history of all of these other histories of inscribe, you know, inscription made me think a little bit of the holobiont and the way that it sort of navigates between the, you know, organism or the self as itself host to multitudes and the ways in which that organism is part of larger communities and sort of mediating between those, those ways of thinking, you know, holism and multiplicity. Um, and also the refusal to sort of impose a unity, right? And I think sometimes with, when we get into biological holism, you know, you know, I'm thinking of Aristotle again, but it's a deep tradition of like wanting to, to unify. And so much of your work is about keeping that complexity open and situatedness and that meanings are not erased, but they are shifted, not always how we want them to be, but, you know, we experiment with what they can mean in different contexts, different relations. And I wanted to sort of use that kind of through line in your work to go back to, to a point that you brought up in terms of your thinking of how you build community in the space of a work. Um, and I think it, that's a constant in the work from the occasion to a work like scalable, um, skeletal escalator, which is, which is a slightly different form. And that's the idea that the visitor is involved in a series of feedback loops and that the dancers themselves are making decisions and that you're also involved in that work. And I know that you've thought a lot about that negotiation of different agencies in a community thought about the ways you know sometimes people will will critique relational models and you know but where is dissensus where is the sort of conflict and, and agonism and i don't think your work erases that i think that it's always negotiating with difference and synthesis or, or consensus um which is a, a latin translation of, of the, Greek, the greek word sympathia but i wanted to just ask you maybe about how you think about the the composition of the holobion in the work with the video. Um, talk a little bit more about the feedback that you're managing, but also that it happens. Hmm. Yes, I think that if I started to understand the experiment with format continued, and the more I wanted to kind of um, distribute or re reconfigure um, typical, uh, let's say, hierarchical structures that belong to the theater typically or conventionally um, to to you know not not only you know I don't I don't apply that as a kind of across the board critique I have no critique of um, you know kind of consensual practices where someone is taking clear leadership and directorial a directorial process nonetheless as as the complexity of my work the duration of the work and the the, the kind of will or wish for um, Really, the doing so, not representing the holobiont, but really trying to operate, like to, to sort of make compositions that be, that are life, that are not life-like, but are actually living processes. I think this is kind of what drives me towards this uh, inspiration <laughs> from from the holobiont, and then really trying to be um, consistent and thorough in my own. Um, you know, be rigorous in my own approach to that, but to, to really push myself to think of which kind of practices would need to be engaged in order to not actually represent this, but to actually operate with this as a methodology. And I, I, in this, I start to understand that we need certain um, rules of engagement somehow and rules of distributing um, responsibility. Um, so in... in um, Scale of the skeletal escalator. We we applied a kind of game structure um, that I call. It's actually in a way born inside of a, a workshop format uh, of mine that's that's from 2010 uh, called communal epic fiction. So communal experience in performing instantly created fiction, and, and this was a kind of game structure for distributing agency uh, and collective composition in kind of temporary rounds where the roles were constantly be reshifted and, and shifting again and shifting again. So you would uh, kind of appoint or assign or uh, take on a particular role or position, whether it was um, being attentive to the material elements in the space or being attentive to the production of sound or the production of bodily and physical gestures or to the actual, actual hosting and address of the public. So there were all the multiple roles involved in to, to actually operate, and inside of those, those, yeah, those roles would, would be sort of taken on 
in a game structure and would also be uh, you know, change roles throughout uh, the day and find uh, basically techniques and strategies of uh, collective composition with four rules. Um, the first was that you know everyone is an expert in everything and the opposite. Uh, rule number two, we will be civil, but we will not be polite. And this is for me a really key rule for, for um, any kind of improvisation uh, situation with another is that uh, politeness kills any, it flattens and dampens any kind of like generative, uh, productive tension. So rule number two is very much about we, we, when we agree to this, we are consensual adults agreeing to play this game of composition together. We understand as the basis of any of our activity is, is respect, mutual respect and um, care. And then that is something separate than, than actual politeness, which brings all these forms of hesitation and second thing and doubt. Um, so to, you know, that means conflict is very possible and it's even welcomed inside of a situation that is then it, it becomes mm -hmm. a change of a situation. Um, rule number three, um, mm -hmm, anyone can direct the situation. So actually this role of directorship is distributed in the sense that that becomes a temporal decision, decision in time that anyone can um, try to implement their vision at any particular moment. And that goes hand in hand with rule number four, that no one is obliged to follow. Uh, so this practicing of your own uh, relation to a direction or to um, is, is like a knee-jerk reaction to say yes is just as suspect as a knee-jerk reaction to say no. So uh, you have to kind of really become conscious of your own decision-making process, um, figuring out when you go with the flow and when you don't. And um, with these kind of four simple rules and of course practice and, and developing a trust through conversation, working together, dancing together, expressions of care, um, and oh, in time, um, you, we were able to kind of, in that six week process, every day engage the performance in a new way you know, with the kind of taking in the energetic presence and decision making of the visitor. Wow. I mean, I think that's so powerful in thinking about trust, you know, taking trust as something that has to be built as a condition of conflict and also responsibility, which I think a lot of times collectivity struggles with, with questions of responsibility and, um, and how that works with collaboration. I'm mindful of the time. And so what I, what I'm going to do, um, we're going to do a two and a half minute listening exercise, but I just want to, I'm going to maybe just put this out there because for me, it's such an important part of the practice, your practice and working as an academic across different disciplines. I think being in conversation with, with you and thinking about your practice and how collaborative it is, even beyond the boundaries of a single work where you're working with so many people across disciplines and conversation. And so, so much of, the thinking around the work in your own experimentation is in these larger communities of trust and conversation and responsibility. And, and, and I, and just to say, I think that's been incredibly inspiring for me. Um, and, and I think I often share that with students doing interdisciplinary work in, in a range of settings to, to invite them to think more about their work as a practice and a collaborative process practice without the abnegation of responsibility or, you know, but moving between these different dynamics. So that part of your work, I think is, is so resonant. Um, and we might, we might be able to talk about it more in the Q and A, but I am mindful of, of both giving the audience the opportunity to do the listening exercise and making sure we have time for questions from the audience. So Christian, do you want to transition at this point to the listening exercise? So again, this is two and a half minutes. Um, and, and we invite you to submit questions. Um, via the channels and we'll we'll shift right to questions after this. You are moving. Dancing is happening. It's slow. You have been rendered horizontal to the floor, and your limbs seem to move at an even, uninterrupted pace. A continuous effect 
a fluidity is produced. The fluidity of a viscous material in a steady and constant rate of change. The body morphs from one shape or suggested image into another in a gradual process of transformation. An arched back, a twisted tree trunk, an animal, maybe a puma, an ancient Greek statue, the figure thought to be Dionysus from the east pediment of the Parthenon, and many more strange reorganizations of limbs that always suggest a change before fully delivering an image, before concretizing. You are in quiet concentration, sinking down, receding into the back of your consciousness. There are no calculations happening in your head. You are awake in another way. So thank you so much, Isabel, for sharing the exercise for, for the conversation. Jennifer, um, I think... Uh, you're going to turn it over to you to moderate questions. Yes, great. And, uh, you know, please both participate in this and we'll, we'll make it quite informal. Um, I'm just going to start with a question of my own and then turn to the, the questions that other people have offered, which are um, kind of wonderful. So I, I'm curious, Isabel, I mean, and thank you for this beautiful presentation, it really clarified so many things and raised so many questions. Um, I was interested in the ways that you are talking about your work um, as this kind of assemblage of many, many parts, and, uh, and you used often the word transformation and change and, the, the, you know, this whole idea of the building of community. I was wondering how you see that in terms of the body itself. In you know, is there in your work uh, an emphasis or a some kind of a rejection or whatever it may be, you know, of the actual um, transformation of the of the human physical form? Um, you know, which you know, I'm thinking, you know, your your sort of conversation with with classical ballet, which which can be almost violent in the ways it wants to actually change the human form. So I'm just wondering how, where are you, how you, what your thinking is on that. Great question. And uh, a few things immediately come to mind. And uh, uh, I suppose immediately I have to think of Sylvia Winter, whose work on kind of people invested in at the moment. And the, the figure, like her, her, understand, her figure of the, the human as bios mythos, mythoi. Uh, so this, this, we are biological, but we are, are the stories that we tell about ourselves. Um, and I think the power of that understanding that um, the ideas we have about ourselves as humans is also forms our capacities, our abilities to, to be in our ways to be and navigate, let's say, in the world that we mediate our relationship to through our senses. So I suppose my, I have a kind of, um, there's a political goal inside of what I'm doing, I suppose, and that, that really has to do with um, to what degree, like how do I, how, what do I need to do to cultivate my capacities to um, transform and create transformation and change in my world? So I see it as a, a development of the of the, sen the sensibilities, the cultivation of the sensibilities we need, the kind of micro politics of the, of the body. Mm -hmm. um, to, to in order to cultivate that that capacity, like because I think that 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 informs everything 
you know, sort of how we how we understand our relation to ourselves, ourselves as like a, a very multiple multiple thing. It's we to our hollow violence, um, and how how that how we navigate our our uh, immediate relationships with our world. And I think that um, this is where. The, to me, this is the starting place for for those kinds of transformations, and that needs to be affective and felt and, and enacted on the level of the, the felt body in order to um, be able to generate, imagine, reimagine, create the new forms of governance, the new forms of education, the new forms of community that we would need, I think, for, for the social transformations that we're looking for. Yeah, terrific. Um, I mean, following on that is a question that came through the Q&A. Um, this person says, um, talking about what has been inscribed onto you and the archive of the body, I would love to hear your thoughts about what history of emotions and trauma we hold in our body, both personal and generational, and what space that plays in your work, if it does. Beautiful question, and absolutely, especially more and more. I think recently, uh, actually, when I was creating Scalable Skeletal Escalator, um, I came across a small book um, called Impressionable Biologies um, by that I think is in the bibliography that we're going to share um, later. That is kind of looking at the like a brief history of like the idea of plasticity in the body, like how how. Um, formed or shaped are we, how impressionable are we in relation to our, um, our ambiance or our, our, our cosmos. And, um, and I think what uh, he also takes on, he goes from sort of humoral theory of the Middle Ages to um, contemporary epigenetics, which is something I don't know a lot about, but something I'm very interested to get to know more about. Um, and with epi an epigenetic model, um, we, we, we move away from the kind of linear idea of the human, human genome project and this kind of string of code into a much more enfolded uh, time as enfolded history as folded in and over itself so that stories and histories actually also inform or um, affect genetic expression. So mm -hmm. I think in that sense, you know, generational trauma, generational stories, um, all of this is, is very alive in the present. It's completely not the past. It's very much lived um, in the present. Um, and and, and a, a level of complexity that we really need new, new models of thinking about time and space to really um, I think dive into and deal with. Yeah, I mean, in a way, you're, uh, you're, you're sort of saying that it, it doesn't, um, we might not know it at all. But it's kind of there in this in this sort of human physical DNA that we're that, that's also an emotional archive. Absolutely, and I think this this you know which which practices and to what degree do we want to tap into all of that? It's a lot right. of information, you know. And I, but nonetheless, I think um, there are it, for me the dance as a practice for mediating my relationship to the world and to myself has been very rich and very deep and allows me to delve into those emotional, um, psychological, these deep spaces that, I mean, I don't know if I, I can bring articulation to some of those insights that I know that that are held in my body and that I, I can express and, and sort of feel and come in contact with through a completely non-verbal, non-rational lens, let's say, through the yeah. I'm going to do something that is a little, um, I hope people won't mind this, but I'm going to read the next question and then I'm going to end the event and hope that some people will stay because I know your answer is going to be very interesting. So um, just because we are at 1230 and I know how these things are on, on Zoom. So here's the question that we're going to leave everyone with and continue with if you would like to stay. Um, I was wondering if one could think of the, the multisensorium works that you showed us today as a certain way of orchestrating the senses, given orchestra's etymological relationship to the dance and your own artistic background. Is this a valid characterization of some of these works? And if it is, is your role 
in this orchestra that of the conductor? Or are you seeking a sensorial orchestra that would have a shifting conductor, moving not only from the dancer to the painter and to the sculptor, to the sonographer, but also from the human to the non-human, the compost, and so on. And before we get to the answer to that, I do want to thank Brooke and Isabel and the CB CBA team, Andrea and Christian. I want to thank our co-sponsor, Princeton University's Lewis Center for the Arts and our co-presenter, the Remark Institute, and to thank all of you for joining. Um, uh, we will be in touch by email, and um, if you need to leave now, please obviously feel free. You can go whenever you wish. <laughs> um, and we're very happy that you were here with us today, and thank you very much. Um, but we will continue for a few minutes. So, Isabel, <laughs> Brooke. This uh, question, I'm, I'm actually taking a look at it, uh, I'm reading it as well, um, again, and I think it's it's a fantastic place of orchestrating. Mm, yes, the, 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 I didn't know about the et etymological relationship of like, like orchestra, I, 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 I never looked into it, so I thank you for that uh, reflection. Um, it's an interesting question you're posing here, and I think that in some ways, I, I, I wouldn't I don't think, I think what I'm doing inside of my work is sort of amplifying our innate human capacities um, in some ways. Uh, so I, I don't know if I'm so much as conducting the, the sensorium, uh, I'm, I'm certainly addressing and, and, and certainly I do think about like, the dramaturgy, the dramaturgy of experience through space and time. I think that's kind of what choreographers do. Um, uh, so certainly there's a, there is a sense of, of composition. Um, nonetheless, there's, there's also a, a, there's a way in which, yes, the, the multiple conductors, the ways in which the, the guests um, and the public are the co-authors of their experience and the choices that they make as they move through these works, the amount of time they choose to spend and the degree of engagement that they that they do engage with. So I would say it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting. I, I really like what you're saying, orchestra conductor. Um, but the sense of shifting conductor is maybe even more um, at what you sort of bring out in the second part of your question. The idea of um, the shifting conductor is quite quite interesting because I do think what I find interesting about you bringing the, the word of conductor in is that it isn't exactly random. It isn't that anything goes. It is that, that, that there is a, a, a will for composition and there's a care towards that um, unfold of um, experience. So it's not only that uh, these elements are thrown together and, and you know, whatever happens, happens. Again, at the same time, uh, smell, um, visitors, like free will and agency and movement through space, all of these things are, are things are way beyond my uh, control, right? And and and, and, uh, and furthermore, I have the, the reason I work this way is to is to actually create other kinds of spaces where that that are actually not about control, but that are about one's own uh, recognition of their uh, responsibility or agency inside uh, of the work. Um, but certainly, conditioning the let's say you know, why all of this, why all of this human sensory, why addressing all of these multiple senses, it's like, um, has to do with, yeah, can actually conditioning the space and encounter. So in, in what, if, if we live, like we do, we are educated in a world and we live in a world, um, for me, uh, based in, let's say, let's say Euro-American context, I'll be specific there, um, where uh, the biggest, uh, you know, it's, it's competition, it's conflict, it's coercion, it's um, our social relations are, are um, disjointed and interrupted by bureaucratic systems. Um, so we, there, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of, there's, there's so much that, that um, informs and conditions our day-to-day -day experience, just urban, urban space, uh, urban planning. Uh, there's so, so many things condition that. Uh, so I think when I create these works, I'm very much thinking about like which conditions 
of a situation would be necessary or, or, or could be experimented with to maybe allow another way of sensing oneself and another, or sensing oneself and the relation to another living or non-living human or non-human. Um, I think that, that I, I do spend a lot of time imagining the, 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 yeah, the conditions of that encounter. Um, and then there is this kind of co-creation, co-creative then process that, that happens with all of the collaborators and the contact with, of course, the... I hope that maybe gets at some of your questions. Thank you. It was a really, really beautifully phrased question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to follow up on that, we've got so many questions, so I'm conflicted about even... Um, saying this, but I I think, you know, in a way, maybe the question also has to do with sort of how much, like, on a, like, on the ground, practical level, the way you talk about your work, it does have a feeling of, ex, of uh, immense expansiveness and a certain kind of um, process that allows for many things to happen spontaneously, and yet, as you say, there is a uh, how did you put it? It was very well put. You know, some kind of impulse for for composition. Um, so, uh, how how do you actually make that happen on the on the ground with all of the artists that you're working with? Is it maybe it's not easy to describe that? Maybe it's different each time. I don't know. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a good question. You know, I think that, that that it has a lot to do with the time and developing conversations over time yeah. so all, all of the uh, people that are mentioned uh, for example in Spain with a skeletal escalator um, we have histories of, of working together so there's there's a, a, a kind of let's say inside of the work I try to kind of generate a let's say a sort of kind of the, a kind of culture of that specific world so that um, yes I make uh, directorial compositional that choices can be inhabited with people's own life. subjectivities that contribute and nonetheless are, are kind of um, gathered within uh, uh, an aesthetic uh, uh, ethos aesthetic, an ethos and an aesthetic world let's say um, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. makes, certainly yes there are decisions to be made about you know what's what is the very, what's the primary moment of encounter? You know, what is the, like, the, what's the communication about the work, the language around the work that I, I put a lot of work and time into? You know, is it smell that is the very first thing or is it the sound or the boom of a bass or, you know, the, this kind of the unfold of the sensorial and these, mm -hmm. these questions that I attend to um, and many um, compositional choices that are made inside the work, but it also, let's say, other aspects of composition are, are really made by the collaborators, let's say the performers, um, are given the agency to, to create and to find practices and to, and to become, to sort of ask questions about those practices and, and that create, that also moves forward, um, the composition. But let's say that that needs to also be, you know, we're tuned in to each other through, let's say, compositions, uh, scores, game structures, so different kind of positional tools which, which many people will maybe be familiar with from music improvisation or from uh, history of experimental music, for example. These kinds of strategies are also at play, say, inside the work. Um, maybe we have time for one, one more. Um, have you experienced authentic movement? And how does that relate to your practices? And I'm going to admit I don't know what authentic movement is, so maybe you can explain that if you... <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know a lot about it, although I do, I have done it. It's something that it's, it's, it's um, I actually think, is it a, even, it may be trademark, so the person who, who asked the question can maybe also jump in and say more about it, but I, I know that authentic movement is a somatic uh, practice, um, in which you, you really go away, you know, I think for, for a particular moment in uh, contemporary dance history, it's really important because it sort of moves away from all of this um, dance studio culture of sort of mirrors and 
looking in mirrors and checking your movement and then it moves away from the mimetic, which is always a part of dance education, kind of watching it. Right. Imitation. Imitation, exactly. It moves away from that and away from a sense of kind of judgment of the production of movement and moves towards an internal, uh, let's say, searching internally for impulses to movement and trying to kind of find and have a relationship with those impulses and responding to them. And so it really is tuning in to um, oneself on a somatic level. Um, I think my, my criticism of authentic movement uh, in, in some way, whilst I also find it an interesting practice, um, I have a, like, it, 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 I, I, I doubt the holistic ness of the body. I think in, in the way that I work with the idea of the body, as, as Brooke also mentioned before, there's there's a there's a, a lot. There's there's discontinuity, there's fragment, there's there's also continuity, there's histories and stories, there's layers. It's really complex and it's it's a it's a it's and to bring up this word that in scale the skeletal like contamination um, as a kind of contaminated ecology um, driven by like sort of human uh, yeah technological progress, um, this is where, so I, from my, I, I already address myself as, as hollow and cyborg, you know, so, so I don't know, let's say, in how I, at least how authentic movement was introduced to me, um, I felt that it, it seemed to address a more, a kind of a, a holistic understanding of the body, and I think I, I work from another place when I think about um, movement. Um, and uh, nonetheless, I do find it a really, I think it can be a very healing practice for people that have maybe also experienced other kinds of relationship to, to dance that has anything to do with sort of competition or sport or, or uh, stringent technical ideas. I think it can be a very um, healing thing to, 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 to experience authentic movement and to, to, to take a workshop with someone who's, who's experienced in guiding it. I know we're going to, um, we're going to wrap up, um, but there's a question in Zoom that I wanted to, to just draw out um, how we reach the body soul while talking on Zoom um, and, and how to uh, you know, transform the format. And, and I think, you know, it's wonderful. We can be together again after being on Zoom all the time. Um, and just to say, I mean, it's a wonderful to, to have the opportunity being scattered across time and space to come together. I love hearing you talk about your work, Isabel, and being in conversation and it is a particular format Zoom that um, is sometimes the technology we use. But I will say, if if you have the opportunity to experience a work of Isabel Lewis's, please take it. This is not the same. Um, and and I hope everyone will will have that opportunity because it is singular. Yes, I think that is a good place for us to end. And mindful of the, of Isabel's time and Brooke's time, so I am. Um, Grateful to you both for being here, and um, thank you all for coming, and um, to be continued at some point, I hope. So thank you. Thanks again, everyone. It's thank you. Great. Take care. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, of course. Bye.